distinguished guests, esteemed colleagues, dear students. Welcome to the China Debate. My name is Michelle Hawkes, and I'm the director of the SOAS China Institute. The Soas China Institute represents Europe's largest community of China scholars. Yes, we do speak Chinese. We teach and study China across a wider range of disciplines and in greater complexity than any other institution. And we're also very modest. The SOAS China Institute also harbors an explicit intention to promote dialogue about China between those who work in academia, in business, in government, in NGOs, and in the media. Our annual China debate epitomizes that vision. This year's debate will devote itself to a dialogue about the social, economic, environmental, and cultural health of the country. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce you to the moderator of this year's debate, Sir Christopher Hull. Sir Christopher has had an extremely distinguished career in the British diplomatic service culminating in holding the post of Her Majesty's Ambassador to China. He also recently served as Master of Gordon and Keyes College at the University of Cambridge. He is an astute observer and analyst of Chinese affairs, and I'm delighted to say he's currently registered at SOAS as a student. <laughs> I shall now hand over to Sir Christopher, who will introduce the other panelists in the format of tonight's event. Uh, please join me in welcoming. I will switch back to English to say thank you very much for that um, introduction. Um, it is correct that I'm now a graduate student at SOAS. If I wasn't here, I would be revising for next week's exam on Southeast Asian art. Um, but let me move straight into the introduction uh, of our very distinguished group of panelists. Um, sitting on my left, I have uh, Beverly Sun. Uh, Beverly is one of the first American female entrepreneurs to establish a real estate and relocation firm in East Asia, uh, first in Hong Kong, and then she expanded into China in 1995. Uh, she's based in Hong Kong, but travels uh, all the time in mainland China. Uh, secondly, we have Professor Andrew Walter, uh, he has a chair at the School of Humanities and Sciences at Stanford. Uh, he's a member of the Department of Sociology uh, and also part of an Institute of International Studies. Uh, he's previously taught at Columbia, Harvard, and Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Uh, he's written extensively on China, and his latest book, which has come out this year, is China Under Mao, A Revolution derailed. Uh, and then on the far left, on my far left, we have Isabel Hilton. She's based in London, a writer, a broadcaster. Um, she has reported from around the globe. Uh, she is the founder and editor of China Dialogue, which many of you will know as a, a, a bilingual, um, what would you call it, web-based magazine dealing with environmental issues. It's very influential. Um, she has uh, written for BBC Radio and Television and for a number of the um, press, the written media as well. Now, if I can just explain how the evening is going to run. Um, first, I'm going to ask each of the panellists to give a short presentation on our topic, how healthy is China. Um, as you'll have heard, they come from different places in the world, different backgrounds, and that, of course, is the point of bringing them to bear on this subject, which can be interpreted in a lot of different ways, political, economic, social, uh, environmental. 
Uh, there'll then be a short period of discussion between the panelists. I invite them to comment on points raised by um, their, their fellows in their initial presentations. Um, and then for the fi final part of the session, um, there will be some questions to be answered. Uh, members of the audience, and I'm not sure whether all of them are yet present, uh, have been invited to put in questions in advance. Uh, we have chosen some excellent questions. I will invite the audience members who are here to pose their question, and they will be answered by the um, So, let us begin, and I will turn to Beverly to make the first presentation. Thank you all for the honor of being here. It was in 1980, two years after Deng Xiaoping took the monumental step to open China's doors to the West that I first stepped into China. Crowds of blue uniforms would walk up to me in the streets and stare at me because I had more colorful outfits that looked like I had come from another planet. True. Today, of course, everyone looks as though they've walked out of Nazi Town or Vogue magazine. In 1985, I founded a relocation real estate company in Hong Kong and continued my travels to China. And in the early 90s, I established a presence there in Shanghai and then grew to Beijing and Guangzhou with, with projects in over 20 cities um, across China. When my first employee asked me what my vision was in China, I told them that it was simply to provide services with integrity to Western multinationals and to one day work with Chinese companies who would want the same type of value added services. And here we are today. I think we would all agree that China has enormous potential to continue to modernize, yet is facing major challenges. In considering the health of China, there are many possible metrics by which to measure or assess China's health. Economic growth, <coughs> trends, education, food safety, environmental concerns, political freedoms, corruption, the list goes on. These forces are complex, highly interdependent and difficult to aggregate to come up with an overall assessment, in my opinion. And rather than discuss these specific metrics and overlap with my esteemed fellow panels, qualified views on economics and politics, I'd like to take a different approach. Instead, having been in Greater China for over 30 years, I will give a humanistic perspective of the health of China. After all, China is comprised of each of its 1.4 billion individuals. Understanding how healthy China's individuals are is another way to understand how healthy China is as a country, especially in such a highly collective society. So how do you assess how healthy are China's people? One way of capturing the overall effect that these many economic and social forces have on China's people is to look at what is important to the people of China. What do people care about most? What needs are they trying to satisfy? A good framework to analyze this question is one you'll likely be familiar with, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It describes the priority of a person's needs. The foundation is the basis. Human need, food, water, survival. <coughs> Once that's attained, one can afford to move up a level and focus on safety and continued survival. Shelter, environment, employment, financial security, health. Then comes belonging. Relationships, family, friendships. <coughs> the fourth is esteem gaining the respect of others, material goods, social stature. And once all of these are achieved, one can focus on self-actualization, a higher purpose, be that religion, community service, or improving society. Maslow's hierarchy is a way to assess the health of a person in the grander sense of the word. Similarly, the health of a country can be inferred by determining what is most important to it and its people. Survival, a higher purpose, or something in between, or somewhere in between. The Chinese hierarchy differs somewhat from Maslow's. China's strong collective culture and values, with 90%, 92% of the people being Han Chinese, 
one ethnicity, one culture, are based on deep relationships. You all know that Guangxi is one metal to the Chinese culture. And it is. The family. In China, relationships are not the third level of the pyramid, but are part of survival, one of the basis of human needs. That is the basis, not the third. So for today's discussion, the Chinese pyramid has four levels, not five. So where is China on this modified pyramid of what is most important to people? The dramatic shift from an agrarian society to the China of today is more than simply the massive wealth creation that has occurred. People have moved quickly beyond the bottom tiers of the hierarchy, survival and safety direct to esteem. And this has been mostly obvious manifested in materialism as the simplest way to gain self-esteem and social status. The rise of the Chinese consumer and focus on luxury brands and displays of wealth is well known. It's only natural and part of the evolution. These material displays re represent the first time people have moved <coughs> above the bottom tiers of the hierarchy in generations. But a growing number of China's youth and leaders are already moving past the desire for worldly goods and are focused on broader societal good, a better environment, a support system for the underprivileged, the aged, their parents, the eradication of corruption. People are increasingly spending their money on enriching their lives, not by purchasing luxury goods, but by exploring their own country and the world. A hundred million Chinese tourists traveled globally in 2014. Why? To experience and understand other cultures, their art, their music, their architecture, how they do business, how the society functions, foods that they enjoy, and on and on. And as they do, they bring back intangible souvenirs, both subliminally and at the conscious level, values. Their travel shaped their perception of the world, and that is what is important to them. My business is in corporate workforce mobility, and we have been increasingly working with Chinese multinationals who are sending people across the globe. These young executives are excited. More often than not, it is not because they see the international assignment as a means to their career and income, but they're excited about the exposure and about bringing home best practices to further not only their career, but their companies, but also their country. They're focused on how their learning can benefit China's future. This is their self-actualization, their way of improving society, and they are already at the upper tier of this pyramid. I'm not saying that everyone in China is yet at the top of Maslow's hierarchy. There is a way to go. But overall, the people of China are very much moving into the top two realms, esteem and higher purpose. That is healthy. But just as with the medical assessment, the absolute metrics are only part of the story. Knowing if your patient is improving or on the decline completely changes your prognosis. So let's look at the trend. The trends I mentioned earlier, global travel, the focus on improving society, these are all continuing to grow. I mentioned 100 million Chinese tourists in 2014. This year will be predicted to be at 140 million. I increasingly see this in my daily life and in my work. Everywhere I turn, I meet young people. And these are people who are 35 years and younger with whom I work and who are excited about the future but are also increasingly focused on integrity on learning and contributing to their society. Fundamentally, what inspires me about China is the tremendous sense of openness and interest in the world, optimism and drive that I see in the younger generation. You see this trend best in social media, Weibo, Ren Ren, QQ, and others. Social media is exploding and has enabled Chinese youth to congregate and express what is important to them, what they value. And it's not the discussion board about the latest car, the trendiest fashions, or the latest celebrity news. It's about the environment, 
food safety, high standards of education, and improving the social good. It's about integrity and doing the right thing for their family, for their friends, and for their country. It's about their higher purpose. They are increasingly at the top of this pyramid because they can afford to be there. In conclusion, in rapid pace, a population of nearly 1.4 billion has moved from the devastation of the Cultural Revolution to being the second largest economy in the world, and soon to be first. It has done so through a tremendous vision, orchestration, and leadership of the government and drive of its people. Rules, laws, directives can all be there, but unless you have a billion individual human spirits proactively embracing change, making sacrifices, seizing opportunities collectively, in other words, without shared values of what people feel is important, this daunting growth could not have occurred. China's people are keenly focused on China's challenges precisely because they can afford to care about grander sustainable issues beyond their own survival or their individual social status. In other words, because the country is healthier than it has been in decades and perhaps in history, they are collectively ascending in Maslow's hierarchy of needs and are transforming the country into a responsible global contributor. So if you ask me how healthy is China, I believe that although China still faces many challenges, it is arguably healthy and consciously focused on becoming healthier. And whatever people may be in Maslow's hierarchy as individuals, they are ascending. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think there are some very interesting points uh, that we may come back to in our discussion. If we move straight on to Andrew. Right. Okay. Um, I checked the World Bank website this morning, and uh, last year it appears that China pulled even with the United States as the world's largest economy, which is quite a milestone. Both economies are roughly $16 trillion per year in purchasing power parity terms. China's economy has grown 16 times in size since 1980. I'd like to reflect on this uh, landmark and what it means and what it doesn't mean and what, uh, what it uh, says about uh, how far China has come and what the road ahead will be. And I'd like to start by quoting a, a very wise Chinese economist who was quoted about this number uh, last year as it appeared that China was about ready to become the world's largest economy. He said, you foreigners take every number about China and multiply it by 1.3 billion. He said, in China, we take every number and we divide it by 1.3 billion. Uh, and in that spirit, I'd like to talk about what this landmark means uh, for how far China has gone and what the future uh, uh, problems that it may face. So China's GDP per capita, uh, in same purchasing power parity terms, is 11, 000, was $11,800. Uh, last year. That's 10 times the number. That's a measure of the level of development, not just the size of the economy. That's 10, time the so 10 times the size of the economy in 1990. It's double uh, India's level of development. And China and India began the reform and opening process in 1980 at roughly the same level. However, this, this ranks China 63rd out of some 130 countries in the world. Uh, it's at the bottom of the middle income echelon of the world economies. You start to enter uh, the upper income echelon at around $30,000 per year. Um, there are 17 countries that are above $40,000 per year uh, in, in annual uh, income. So in terms of level of development, and this, this surprised me when I looked through the website um, a couple of days ago, what countries does China rank with now in terms of its level of development? These countries would include South Africa, Serbia, Peru, Jordan, the Dominican Republic, and Colombia. Uh, the level of development of countries in the middle income bracket, like Mexico uh, and Brazil, are still 50% higher in terms of per capita income than China. Now, we all know, um, 
Everybody's been noticing that China's growth is slowing. It's been 10% a year, roughly, for several decades. It's slowed to about 7% or less now. Um, World Bank projections and many economists project that within 10 years it will be down to about 4%, maybe even 3%. So the question is, will China, will China be hitting a plateau? Um, will it level off and will it be caught in what is um, often talked about, the um, middle income track, track, which will leave it at about the level of Mexico or Brazil, or will China, China's rise continue uh, and go along the path of countries like South Korea, which was the last country to move into the upper income echelon, or even earlier, Japan. And of course, um, China's leaders have the aspiration, and Chinese people have the aspiration, to continue moving on this upward uh, track and not be trapped at this middle income level. Now, I'd like to argue that, that right now the prospects uh, look somewhat worrying if you look very closely at some of the social figures about inequality, uh, about uh, wages, about the size of the labor force. And I'd like to just briefly discuss uh, five things that are challenges. Uh, first of all, um, wages in China, manufacturing in particular, are rising rapidly. The labor force is shrinking at the same time that you have growth slowing. Secondly, you have a rapidly aging population in a country that's still at a relatively low level of economic development. Uh, third, China has very high levels of income inequality, uh, and its levels of income inequality are unusual for countries outside of Latin America and Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, fourthly, um, there are problems in the educational system, especially basic level education in rural China, which will affect uh, the uh, labor force in the future and its ability to move up into higher value chain of production. And finally, uh, China has a rather pronounced version of crony capitalism, which decades ago was modeled after or was inspired by uh, the Japanese corporate economy, uh, which as we all know has really hit, uh, hit the wall over the last 15 years for reasons I'll talk about briefly. Now, what are the prospects for China moving ahead? Since 1960, only 12 countries have moved from the middle income uh, to high income status. Others, all the others have stagnated at the middle income level. All the countries that have made it out of the middle income trap have had moderate levels of income inequality. So the Gini index, which everyone talks about, uh, China's was uh, in the low 30s, 0.32 or so in the early 1980s. Uh, the higher this number, the more unequal an economy is. Now, all of the countries uh, that uh, made it out of the middle income tra trap had, uh, had uh, Gini indices below 0.4. All of the failed cases were above 0.4, between 0.4 and 0.45. China's current uh, income inequality measure is 0.53, which is really very high, much higher than all of these countries that have failed, actually, to move up. Uh, education. Uh, China's population, the broader population, not the students in the, the best universities that we tend to see all the time, who are very, very talented and very well educated, but the average level of education uh, of the overall labor force uh, is low, and it is not likely to improve soon. Uh, China's Ministry of Education uh, claims that 50% of the labor force has some high school education. Now, Ministry of Education figures are based on governments at each level that report to the upper levels how many students they have in school for which they get subsidies in the budget. Uh, census takers who go to households and ask families how many people in the home have at least some high school education. The number is not 50%, it's 24%. China's Ministry of Education, uh, their figures say that the high school, 83% of high school age uh, population uh, are in high school presently. But the census data say 53%. These figures are lower than those countries that have become stuck at the middle income level. Lower, considerably lower than countries like Brazil, Mexico, Argentina, <coughs> and Turkey. Now I said earlier, why will this why will these numbers not improve? Well, it's fairly simple. Uh, public education in China is not free. 
Uh, in fact, it's fairly expensive, especially uh, in rural areas. It turns out, and I was quite surprised to find this, that China's rural high school education, tuition and fees, are the highest in the world, five times higher than the next most expensive country, which is Indonesia. Now, what this means for China's economy uh, is the following. Uh, one reason for poor high school enrollments is the high demand for labor and the high wages that I mentioned earlier in my presentation. Wages in manufacturing jobs are really quite high. They've been rising faster than the rate of economic growth in China. There's an estimated 1.3 jobs for each worker in the manufacturing sector. This is why wages have risen faster than the growth of the economy. Um, and I, I thought for many years that this would never be a problem for China because that means simply that the processing firms move out of Guangdong in the coastal regions and move into the interior to Sichuan, Gansu, and other places. Turns out, however, I've learned that uh, the, the labor market nationwide is a single labor market. Wages are the same throughout the country in the interior and the coast, and the workers who are willing to work have moved and migrated to the coastal areas already for a very long period of time. Uh, so this means that you have, uh, well, you also have an aging population, it means that this labor force is shrinking and this trend will continue. Uh, roughly two million workers leave the labor force every year in China for the past three or four years, and this number will accelerate as the population uh, ages more quickly in the next decade. Uh, this obviously will threaten the model, the, the, the economic model that was so successful in the last 10 to 30 years. This export led <coughs> growth, uh, it'll affect uh, foreign exchange reserves, trade surpluses. Foreign firms, I'm told, already are starting to move their operations outside of China to other regions. I'm told that Samsung has been moving its operations to Vietnam, its very large operations to Vietnam over the last five years. I don't claim, uh, being from a university in Silicon Valley, I don't claim any special knowledge, but I'm told that Apple is looking to relocate its operations to another country, and I've heard this, they're seriously considering Indonesia. In other words, the exit of these, these export-oriented uh, manufacturing firms has already begun, and it's going to accelerate. And this is why China's leaders and most uh, observers are saying that China has to move to a different, change gears and move to a different uh, model of economic development. Now, I'll briefly mention, obviously, the, the budgetary implications, the fiscal implications of a rapidly aging population, uh, which um, leads to a smaller ratio of people who are employed to people who are retired. This is happening at the same time that the growth rate is already slowing. And because of the one-child policy uh, that was enforced so uh, rigorously for decades, China's population is aging very quickly, uh, and it will be uh, a country at, a, at the lower level of middle income with, a, with an aging population that it will be actually older than the United States population within 10 years. Finally, um, is the big question, I think probably the fundamental systemic questions, all these things that we've been talking about are not that manipul manipulable by policy. Uh, demography is baked in, the size of the labor force, these are not things that any government can really easily uh, respond to in the short run. But the big question really is about what I've called this, uh, what, what's called the Beijing model, uh, or what is really a form of crony capitalism. Approximately 30% of corporate assets are still in the state sector. Uh, many of these are large national champions. Uh, they look very large, very impressive, especially in the world rankings of large, large, the world's largest corporations and Forbes and Fortune magazines. Many of these, however, are actually former planning, former uh, 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 industrial bureaus from the old uh, command economy days that have been restructured and reorganized and merged. Now, these firms don't really operate uh, in the same way as uh, firms in other uh, more market-oriented economies. They have a monopoly or oligopoly position in the domestic market. Uh, they are protected mostly from foreign competition. <coughs> they are being given bank uh, financing from state banks at preferential rates, and when they can't pay, these loans tend to be rolled over, and ultimately, uh, when they're not repaid, the state banking system has to be recapitalized. 
Um, there are very high rates currently of corporate debt uh, due to the investment-led stimulus package uh, of uh, that was the way that China um, avoided uh, an economic uh, downturn after 2008. These firms are in many ways too big to fail. There's a lot of national prestige uh, vested in them, uh, but they're going to have to be restructured or partially privatized or be, be forced to face uh, market-based competition. And of course, this is something that China's leaders know, and it's in the uh, economic reform plan that they um, published last year. Now, this is an economy, I said earlier, that it was, was inspired by the, the Japanese model of the 1970s and 1980s, and I remember uh, how everyone was worried that Japan was going to take over the world back in the 1980s. But, uh, uh, eventually, uh, the protectionism, the crony capitalism, led to stagnation in Japan, and we all need to worry. I think China's leaders are aware of this, and they're trying to think of ways uh, to avoid this kind of thing. So, very quickly, I think my time is, is up, uh, but I'd like to say very quickly a postscript um, on corruption and the anti-corruption campaign. Uh, you can tolerate a great deal of corruption with 10% annual growth. Uh, the current campaign against uh, corruption is highly popular in China. It's long delayed, uh, and uh, I think we all agree that it's something that's badly needed. Uh, but the problem, uh, the reason why corruption is a problem, the problem that uh, Xi Jinping and other leaders see as one of the greatest threats to the future of the, of the party and China's stability, is baked into the organization of the political system, which deeply penetrates the organization of the corporate economy. And it's very difficult as a private entrepreneur at any level to do well without at least good relationships with uh, the local government and government officials. So in other words, to the, the task, while it's, it's easy to understand what needs to be done, this is a politically difficult task to restructure uh, a large economy, that uh, large corporate economy. And what, what really will stay the government's hand is that any changes that you begin to introduce uh, will threaten to lower in the short run growth rates even more. And this is a, a party that really uh, sees uh, high growth rates as essential to stability. So in many ways, they're a bit hamstrung in dealing, it, dealing with it. So I, I think I'll stop here since I've gone over time. Thank you. Andrew, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christopher, and, uh, and thanks to Michelle and to SOAS for this uh, kind invitation. I think it's a very uh, interesting moment to be talking about the health of China. We've been, on the whole, rather positive about China for about 30 years, very impressed with the China miracle, the great growth, the kind of economic um, figures that, that Andrew was quoting. But I think that just at the moment when we reached a point when all our futures are bound up, with China. China is now such a weight in the world that, that whatever happens to China inescapably affects everybody. I hear more and more anxieties about the state of China. And you hear anxieties in Washington, for instance, um, and hurt feelings in Washington. We used to hear hurt feelings in China. There are a lot of hurt feelings in the United States at the moment um, about China's recent um, behavior. And there are great anxieties um, about about the strategic anxieties about China's rise and what sort of uh, player China will prove to be in the international uh, world, not, not helped by the South and East China Sea uh, behaviors, um, which I think have been felt to be disappointing, but also the fear of the internal pressures created by the sort of nationalism of grievance which has been cultivated um, since 1989 as, as the major national narrative. A dangerous choice. Uh, it's, it's a self-created trap, if you like, for China's leadership. And, and I think the seesawing nature of China's foreign policy uh, remains uh, confusing um, uh, to, to, to many observers. And just as we're getting used to the idea that the Chinese economy would power on and, and be the motor of global growth as Western economies fluttered after the great financial crisis. The Chinese economy is slowing, it's aiming at 7%. Most observers think it's around 4.55 at present. And for many of the reasons, again, that Andrew mentioned, it's not likely uh, to pick up very powerfully, in my view. 
just at the moment when China is trying to, ex to, to execute this, this very important strategic shift from the old model, the, uh, the low added value, high investment, export led, high polluting model, to, the, to moving up the value chain and, and, and all those things, and relying more on, on domestic consumption than, than on extra exports. And domestic consumption is growing, but again, for reasons of demography, it's hard to see that being as powerful a motor as it needs to be. Investment isn't shrinking very substantially, and debt is a very uh, heavy burden. Um, domestic consumption, if you look at an aging population and you look at the, uh, the one-child policy and the impacts of that, where you have a, a younger generation who might be expected to, to spend more, uh, being responsible for um, aging parents and grandparents, they're not going to have uh, as much spare cash in the larger population outside the relatively privileged uh, circles. I think that the moment that China has reached is this strategic economic uh, pivot, if you like. Um, China has set itself some really excellent objectives, <coughs> the 12th five-year plan. If you're looking at the health of China, if I were China's GP and I saw this patient arrive, I would be looking at somebody who was getting on a bit and hadn't really lived very well uh, in the last uh, few years, hadn't really listened to the doctor's advice. So if you look at the, the systems that support uh, health in the ecological sense, in the environmental sense, and therefore the health of its population and the health of the economy, I would say it's looking pretty ropey. And rather like someone who in their late 50s decides to go to the gym, uh, probably should have gone there 20 years earlier, China is now trying to execute a, a very creditable shift to a more sustainable model, which began with the 12th plan and will continue with the 13th plan. The problem is that just as, again, to, not to labour this poor patient matter of fact to death, but, but if you give up smoking in your 60s, it's not nearly as good as giving up in your 30s. And although you'll feel better, you still have a lot of damage. And China is in that condition now. China is trying to move to a more sustainable economy after 30 years of taking the view that rapid growth was what counted, uh, that we'll get rich and then we'll clean up. Um, and now China, uh, in addition to all the other challenges that it faces, is facing the very, very heavy uh, consequences of a very wasteful and polluting model. Now, every industrial economy did this. The Brits started it. The United States did it, Germany did it. We all polluted first uh, with the idea that we would clean up later. The problem China has is that it started off with much, much less headroom than anybody else. If you think China has roughly the same surface area as the United States, but only a fraction of the usable land and five times the population. If you look at any measure, any index of our environmental uh, headroom, if you like, China starts off gravely disadvantaged. That's bad luck. Uh, but that is the reality. So China starts off, for instance, uh, with a very, very low allocation of fresh water. We don't think of China as Saudi Arabia, but North China, uh, it, it has about the same allocation uh, of fresh water. Um, and this, uh, this poor allocation is exacerbated by uneven distribution, so you have sometimes too much water south of the Yangtze and not nearly enough north of the Yangtze. Um, and if you uh, add on to that uh, the fact that it, most of China's surface water and a great deal of its uh, underground water has been heavily polluted through very poor governance, um, through you know, the get-rich-quick approach uh, of, the, of the chemical industry, amongst others, through the fact that almost 20% of the fresh water is taken up by, by coal, by the mining and processing and, and, and general use of coal, um, by the fact that North China has been drawing down uh, its reserves in compensating for, uh, for its um, lack of water by uh, overdrawing water from rivers, by overdrawing from underground aquifers, so that the water table under Beijing, for instance, um, has dropped by some 80 meters, and all over the North China plain you can see indentations um, of exhausted aquifers. Um, 17,000 rivers have disappeared completely, uh, according to the uh, Chinese Geography Survey in the last uh, uh, 20 years. You can see that, that at least in terms of 
a patient who hopes to live a long time, something quite drastic has to happen. And there's a huge economic risk built into this. North China is 40% of, of, the, of, the, of the Chinese economy. Uh, the assets at risk in agriculture are about 3 trillion RMB a year. Um, it's more than 40 trillion in terms of the industrial economy in North China. Uh, none of this can function without water. Power in China. Water and energy are intimately connected decisions. Every energy decision is also a water decision. And that is um, China is running out of room uh, to make uh, energy decisions freely. <coughs> Now China has, uh, there is a sort of definition of, of um, foolish behaviour which is to keep addressing uh, the same problem with the same solution and hoping it will work next time. China's approach to its water problem has been substantially an engineering one. China has built more dams than any other country in history. It continues to build dams. It's currently building dams in one of the world's most active earthquake zones on transboundary rivers, which is probably unwise. Um, and through all this engineering, some of it quite heroic engineering, uh, the water situation in China has got steadily worse. So engineering is not going to fix it. The most recent case of misapplied engineering is the South North Water Transfer Project, a multi-billion dollar project to move really inadequate amounts of rather dirty water at a high energy cost from South China to North China. It's not going to fix North China's water problem, and on a cost per litre basis, it would be cheaper to desalinate. Um, so, curiously inappropriate decisions continue to be made. And I think one of the reasons that they continue to be made is that although we, have, we do see a, a, a tremendous awareness at this point, when we started China Dialogue which is now nine years ago, um, environmental problems really were at the margin of public discussion. There was the beginning of, of uh, a civil society that was concerned with it and, and some very talented and active individuals. But in general terms, the priority was still very rapid GDP growth. Today, environmental concerns are a matter of regime survival. You know, we know about air pollution, which has caused uh, the regime to uh, take quite serious measures. Uh, water pollution and water scarcity uh, are also existential threats to the Chinese uh, economy. Uh, we don't hear so much about soil pollution, but that's uh, an equally severe and extremely intractable problem, um, which is uh, currently a state secret. The extent of it is a state secret. It's more intractable because it's very expensive and difficult to fix. So cleaning up soil and then remediating it so that it is of some use um, is very, very difficult. Now, all these issues have come together um, and, and certainly the government has responded. The 12th five year plan is a bid for sustainability. It will take a long time, I think, uh, to turn the economy around. And meanwhile, the bills for uh, past behaviour will have to be met in some form. And what are these bills? Well, they are the cost of remediation, they are the cost of treating the water rather than discharging dirty water. Uh, they are the costs of, of making an energy transition which allows you to clean up the air. And they are the health impacts on the Chinese population which are equally severe. Um, air pollution is not just ugly and unpleasant, it causes lung cancer. And China's lung cancer rates have gone up almost as fast as the economy, um, if you look at the graph. We don't hear quite so much about other forms of cancer. Cancer villages, entire communities struck by uh, the, the, the effects of the Chinese Industrial Revolution. Um, but they are also severe, and those bills uh, will have to be met. So there is a toxic legacy um, of the race to industrialize, um, and although it is fixable, uh, it, is, uh, it is a burden on the present and on future generations. Um, and just to cheer you up completely, um, let's mention climate change. Uh, China is very vulnerable to the impacts of climate change uh, because most of its development, its advanced development, is on low-lying coastal cities. Um, so sea level rise, uh, monsoon variability, melting glaciers in the Himalaya, uh, all of those are uh, extremely serious. Um, I can see Christopher getting anxious. Um, 
So the good news, the good news is um, that uh, in certain in climate policy, China, uh, China for many reasons is, I think, going to surprise a lot of people uh, when its uh, climate plan is, is published and, and come Paris. Why do I say that? Because China is, at the same time, as suffering all these problems, uh, the biggest producer of solar panels, the biggest producer of, of wind technology. Uh, it has a very uh, large uh, installed capacity for renewable energies. And it has uh, promised to peak its emissions by 2030, probably could do it by 2022, might do it by 2025, um, and emissions will then uh, begin to decline. So that is a very positive contribution that China uh, is going to make. Um, nobody is doing enough, um, but certainly I think the Copenhagen situation in which China was blamed for the breakdown of the talks is not likely um, to, be, uh, to be repeated in Paris, so I'll stop there. And, um, well, thank you very much. I think we've had three very um, rich uh, contributions, and there are many different lines of discussion which lead out of them. What I'd like to suggest, since we're going to have to compress matters a bit, is that I um, try to extract out of those. Um, presentations, really just two questions, and I'd like to put those out, and that will give uh, all three of you an opportunity uh, briefly, please, to, to comment on anything you really like out of uh, what your fellow panelists have said. Um, one of them is, I was, I was very struck by what Beverly had to say about the sense of openness uh, and, and, and curiosity which she encounters on the part of young people. Um, the, the question in my mind is, is that sense of openness and curiosity uh, shared by the party, shared by the government, facilitated by the government in the way which is really going to uh, make China develop in the healthiest possible way? And the other question is on, on this whole question of reform, that there is now on paper, as, as Andrew said, some um, very ambitious plans, some very impressive looking plans, the, the third plenum in the jargon uh, laid out a, a very um, interesting set of reform proposals. But is there a will to put those proposals into effect? Are the vested interests going to be um, overcome? Uh, are those reforms really effectively going to be carried out in a way which will make China's economic health uh, as, uh, as lusty as it should be? So who would like to comment on one or other of those? That's okay. Oh. May I? Yes, yes, yes. It, it, it was just on the question of whether whether the curiosity and the open-mindedness of the young is, is shared by, by the government. I think that uh, I maybe five, six years ago I would have said yes. Uh, today I, I, I would certainly not say that. I think that we've seen increasingly um, concerns uh, expressed at the most senior levels of government about about Western ideas and how dangerous Western ideas, not which are described as dangerous to China, actually they're, they're dangerous perhaps or seen as dangerous to regime survival. Uh, we see an increasingly heavy hand in censorship, an increasingly heavy hand in, in the free flow of information. Uh, we see an increasing arrest uh, on all sorts of charges of people who are thinking, people who are who have set up think tanks, and people who are putting forward ideas about uh, future governance in all sorts of ways. So I think that that is a retrograde trend at the moment. I, I would like to propose that obviously China is a very, very large country. Um, what seemingly may be censorship, which there is, and there has been. I think a, a movement towards, in fact, even rewriting texts and limiting information that flows through the country. By the same token, China is allowing people to leave. It allows thoughtful process. The concern is at what speed. So I think there's a little conflict 
there in respect of, of not and, and cutting back and, and reverting and retrenching. Um, I would like to think that they're looking to slow down the process with innovation and technology and all the strengths and the ills that they, it brings. There is great concern that it goes too rapidly. Let me give you an example. Um, in fact, one of my, my colleagues was on a flight from Shanghai to Guangzhou, and she said, I'm delayed. As it turns out, there was a rumor in Guangzhou that the uh, Uyghur, I don't know if you're aware of it, in Xinjiang, because of the minority group. China looks in what they consider to be an equal opportunity um, position to, to take the Uyghur people to different parts of the country so that they might participate in the economic growth um, of the country. And a rumor was spread that six Uyghurs had attacked a young woman in Guangzhou. And that led to cell phones all the way back to Ulumuchi that led to riots where 200 people were killed. The unfortunate thing about this was that this was only a rumor. So those are just real concerns in terms of growth too quickly, communication too quickly, and it's coming. And China will invest in it. But there needs perhaps to be a certain tempering in terms of speed at which all of this grows. Listening to myself talk, I thought this is really a pessimistic, um, pessimistic talk. Um, I'd like to actually pick up on something that Beverly said about uh, the openness and curiosity. Uh, I was also, I've also been struck by that. Um, I, when I analyze the, the issues facing China, I tend to go heavy on the problems and, and make very clear what, what the huge challenges are. But uh, and this is especially true when I'm in the United States sitting at my desk. And then I go to China, and uh, of course I meet many Chinese people also in the university, but I meet people, I meet basic level officials in China, I meet uh, academics. Um, when I go to villages and talk to uh, village or county level uh, officials, I get the sense of, I mean, very intelligent, hardworking, uh, honest people. I don't actually see the corruption that, that people talk about. I've never been shaken down by a traffic cop for anything like that. When I read books about Cambodia or Russia, I'm constantly, I, I almost adopt this kind of proud feeling as a student of China that China's run, governed much better than these countries. Uh, and you know, this is, uh, most of my work in recent years has been about China in the 1960s, and even in that period, China, uh, the Chinese Communist Party was a very well-organized entity. So uh, there's an irrational part of me that wants to believe that uh, somehow, uh, somehow the, the people of China uh, will be able to pull, pull themselves out of it. So that's my, that's my ham-handed attempt to put in a little bit more happy face. <laughs> it sounded like a pretty gloomy presentation. Thank you very much. Um, now, I'm going also to be a bit selective with the questions which I have. Um, and choose ones which are going to add a new angle to our discussion. Is Henry Devereux some arm? Would you like to ask your question? I feel like David Dimple. Would, would you like to ask your question? Yes, yes. In a loud voice. Uh, okay. um, do you see, do you see any, uh, any likelihood Chinese government willing to spend something like 10% of GDP on health and medicine on the population, say a decade from now, taking into account a, a background of aging demographics. Okay, the question of expenditure on health care and perhaps welfare as well. Um, Beverly, would you like to start? I do see China being very concerned about the welfare of its people. Um, in part of the crackdown on corruption, I would think that the medical industry is one that it brings a great concern to China. 
And as the populace grows and you have a middle income center, the people who now become vocal <coughs> are expressing the need for better medical care or to look at as well as the, as the country having an aged population. China will have to commit to developing a larger medical platform for its people. In fact, I do believe that it is on their agenda and one of the important ones, together with food safety, together with pollution. Shanghai this year has committed to $27 billion to work on pollution, to clear up the rivers, to um, investigate how they might improve the air quality, to look after toxic waste in the area through factories within the Shanghai area. 27 million, not committed to four, a five or 10 or 20 year period. It's a three year commitment that that money will be spent. That um, I, it, it's absolutely right that and health spending is going up um, year on year. I think that there, there, are, there are a number of uh, large social costs which are going to have to be met you know, over the next few years, and one of one of one of the main ones. And, and going back to the questions of inequality, uh, who is going to fund the social rights of the of the rural hukou holders? These are. Uh, migrant workers, 100 million migrant workers who move to the cities but who don't have social rights in those cities. They don't have the right for their children to go to school, they don't have access to, to health, they don't have any kind of social safety net. Um, there is a general acceptance that this is monstrously unfair and it's causing all kinds of additional social problems like left behind children, children who are, who are abandoned in villages and who, 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 in some cases with grandparents, in some cases without. Um, terrible case recently of a suicide of five young children in that situation, which caused a lot of anxiety on social media. The problem is who's going to fund it? So um, the cities where these people uh, have moved are, are many of them in debt. Um, they don't have the right fiscal model, they don't have a local property tax to, to support their expenditure. They give, have to give too much to the government, they don't get enough back. So there's a fight going on right now. Oh, social spending pretty much in all sectors in China. Um, and it's about where the responsibility will finally devolve. Um, and I think until that is resolved, uh, it, it's going to be very hard to know in 10 years' time how, that, how those proportions will pan out. Um, certainly there's a strong sense that it's required, but quite where the money will come from is not clear. Thank you. Now, is Anthony Mack? Uh, yes, please. Given um, China's political system heavily influences its economy, does that mean that its um, economic policy is fundamentally different to that of uh, Western Europe and North America? And if that's the case, then what's the implication for um, any theorists who are trying to analyse how healthy China is? Okay, yeah, that's effective. I think I'll be partially address that by, um, in my comments by saying that um, in many respects China's corporate, large corporate uh, system resembles the Japanese uh, economy, the statehood, uh, coordination between uh, ministries, uh, banking system, and large corporations. Um, another way in which China's uh, actually different from Japan and Western uh, economies is that there are strict capital controls and the banking system is completely state-owned. Um, what, what, what this means is that you're unlikely to see, um, I'm told, a financial crisis of the kind that we experienced in the United States and then spread um, throughout the world in 2007 and 2008 um, because the government has the means to recapitalize the banks immediately. They don't have to do an emergency bailout. In fact, they do this on a more or less annual basis. So it's not going to be a, as volatile uh, a kind of uh, economy as you might expect uh, maybe in Europe after the Greece uh, businesses resolved there as we saw uh, in 2007, 2008. Um, uh, so I guess, I, I guess, yeah, I guess that's basically my answer. Okay. Um, I think
think we're going to go to take two more questions, quite brief ones. Is Annabel Rye here? I'm not sure she is. Um, if not, I'll read her question. Um, to what extent is China at risk of a property stroke construction industry bubble bursting? And what can the government do to deal with this? Our property experts. I think China is quite aware of the bubble burst real estate, the oversupply, um, the cost of real estate having soared as it has. Um, they have now looked to temper construction, temper building um, of new developments, and in fact have shifted a strategy for expansion. Building railways, building infrastructure to allow China to get to Pakistan, the Silk Road so that it might go work through Poland in order to create a distribution center for Europe and building railroads through Siberia, up through Canada, down to the U.S. with the concept of, of an outreach expansion program for their goods and vice versa. The real estate Yes, there is an oversupply, but my belief is that whilst the economy may go down to 5%, um, you still have a thriving economy. I believe in the U.S. We're at, correct me if I'm wrong, 1.3. And that's an optimistic perspective. So in balance, um, I. I think we need to look a little bit more globally when we look at, at these issues and look at all other countries and how they are there. So I'm not as pessimistic about the outcome of China um, because again, I do feel that you have a younger generation, people filled with hope, who are willing to still make sacrifice. They're willing to see the growth and they are collective. It's a very different concept in terms of how they are able, how can a country mobilize itself with it? It's not even 30 years in actuality, perhaps 20. Move as quickly, unless you have the people with the type of willpower and ability to, to make sacrifices and to have hope. Uh, so I, I do feel that um, I'm much more optimistic, I might say, um, because if I look at the water shortage, it is a global problem. I've spoken to a water consultant, and his concern is California, more so than China, because China doesn't have the old infrastructure. It will have the ability to create innovation, to, to find new methodologies. It doesn't have to leapfrog over old infrastructure and, and with the new technology, with new innovation, China probably has more of an opportunity to create um, new resources for itself that others are not. Thank you. Um, and the final question, I think, Luke Williams is not with us, but he asked, to what extent would democratization of China, as he puts it, lead to environmental improvements? Western democracies do not have an exemplary record on fossil fuels and carbon emissions. Isabel, that's me. Yeah, I am um, not sure I entirely accept the premise of the question, which is that all democracies are the same and all non-democracies are the same, and um, it doesn't really stand much examination. So at present, for instance, um, European Union countries are pretty much on target for meeting their Kyoto targets, including Britain. Britain is meeting its Kyoto targets because Mrs. Thatcher closed down the coal industry and went for gas. Entirely different reasons, but, uh, but nevertheless delivered a climate, um, delivered a, a climate bonus. On the other hand, Canada, uh, Poland, uh, and Japan are not doing too well. Australia is not doing too well. 
and India finds it very hard to make any decision at all. Um, but exemplary democracies like, like Sweden and Denmark are aiming to be 100% fossil fuel free in the next couple of decades. So I think you, you know, I, the, so the starting point that, that you know, democracies are performing worse, I, I think is not necessarily true. On whether democratization, I think, I think we, we always try to look at, at the possibility of reform in China through probably the wrong lens, um, because we seem to be looking for a ballot box behind every, behind every uh, under every table, it's not going to happen. But, but China's system, which is more like responsive authoritarianism, is certainly concerned with public opinion, and it is concerned with the future. And that leads it to make um, decisions which are going to be uh, more environmentally friendly. And certainly, as I said in my remarks, in terms of climate policy, China sees a strategic opportunity, and quite rightly, um, for its for new technologies. I think environment, uh, rather than climate, and these are not the same thing. Uh, the, the, the difficulty I think that China faces in terms of cleaning up its environment is one of governance. Um, if you look at industrial societies that did clean up, they did so with the benefit of a robust civil society, uh, a robust uh, legal system, so polluters could be taken to court by well-funded uh, NGOs, um, a freedom of information and a free press, a transparency, accountability, all those good things which make for governance. What we have in China is a lot of very good laws, very, very poorly applied. Now, there is some sign that in the 13th plan um, a great deal of thought has gone into this. Uh, and so we will see reforms of a governance system which could well affect an improvement. One, for instance, is to make uh, officials responsible over their lifetime career for the decisions and the consequences of the decisions that they make. Rather a good idea, I think we should do that. Um, that means you can't just, you know, wreck a town and move on and say in 20 years' time, oh, I can't even remember who was there. It will follow you and it will affect your promotion prospects and that will make behaviour much more responsible in the day. So that's a good example of thinking about how within a top-down system you do get uh, better governance and I hope it works. Um, I still think that um, the kind of restrictions that are coming down on civil society are not going to help. Um, you need to engage the population in this kind of thing. You can't do it alone as a government. And I think that uh, China is handicapping itself um, in that respect by, by not empowering uh, its people. Thank you. Um, I'll now hand back to Michelle for uh, some final remarks. So the question we have asked has divided opinion. And China as a subject of study divides opinion. It's very tempting um, to spend most of your time talking to and sitting in a room with people who have basically the same opinion about China as you have, and not reach out and talk to people who come from different perspectives and have different opinions. What we've been trying to do here today, and what we'll continue to do next year and the year after and the year after, is to bring people together who hold different perspectives and who want to enter into the conversation and want to have that dialogue. Uh, and I, for one, am delighted at the wonderful example set tonight by our panel. Uh, and I would like all of you to ask them, to, uh, to thank them with a warm round of applause.